Let's bow and pray. Our Lord and our God, we ask very simply that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart may be acceptable in your sight. Amen. So John the Baptist and Jesus, of course, were contemporaries. John the Baptist came from a tradition that was familiar with, to the Jews. And uh, John the Baptist was different in the expected way. And he was preparing for someone who would be different in an unexpected way. A trinity wants to be different than the conventional difference. We want to avoid falling into a new rut. And we want to introduce a new way of being different, just as Jesus brought a new way of being different. <clears throat> I'm going to break a rule this morning because I think it's uh, important for ministers not to be self-referential in uh, illustrations and such. But things go in cycles, and, uh, and some of the cycles are our very own cycles, and they're shared by, by many of us. Remember Greb Kodiaks. Now, I don't know, uh, I'm 56, and some people in the congregation may have crested that a little while ago. And uh, some may not have crested it yet. But when I was, what would I have been? 14, 15, all, well, most of the boys in, uh, in my high school. And uh, you can't say neighborhood because there were, what, 17 people in Mosher's Corner. And, uh, and we would get in the bus and go to Middleton, which was the... Um, the regional center. And the regional center where I lived had a population of about 1,400, I think. It was a very small town. We had a Stedman's. And uh, uh, we all wore our Greb Kodiaks, of course, only laced up to the middle, probably not uh, tied, but if they were tied, they were just tied off so as the laces wouldn't come all the way out. And you'd tuck your jeans in them, and you'd walk around. You'd call them winter boots, but they'd fill full of snow because, well, you tucked your pants inside of them. Well, I've been looking for these for, uh, for about a year now. And uh, they're not made by Greb anymore. Greb disappeared. But someone makes Kodiaks again. And these are the, I can't read because I don't have my glasses on. It either says heritage or traditional, probably heritage. But these are the heritage Kodiak boots. And uh, I'll come to church tomorrow morning with my jeans on and be certain to have my jeans tucked into my Kodiaks on tide because that's the way I remember them. They were familiar and they're wonderful, but these come from the old Greb Kodiaks, but they're not really Greb Kodiaks. There's something a little bit new, but they're familiar to the, to the place where we come from in our youth, and they're uh, really a brand new thing modeled after a familiar thing. You can't see it now, and mostly you can't see it because they're not actually sitting on the stands, but we have two stands on either side of the church in the front here to hold two projectors. And uh, Tom Folks has been very generous in donating the stands, projectors, and uh, the installation of, uh, of these new pieces of technology to aid us in our worship and aid us in our ministry in various ways in the church. And uh, it's very exciting. I'm looking forward to using them because it is something new. Now, the projectors are new, but using projectors isn't really new. If we look in our back room, we have an old overhead projector that that we would have used in worship and we would have used in our um, uh, team meetings 
would have used in council, we would have used at the annual meetings, no doubt. We have a Gestetner probably uh, kicking around somewhere, which when we first started using it was new and an exciting technology that was going to streamline the way we worship together. So PowerPoint projectors are new to us, but adopting new technology and incorporating it into uh, our worship and the life and ministry of the church is not a new thing. We've always done that. John the Baptist was not a new thing to the Jews. John the Baptist, uh, when we read of John the Baptist, will seem, of course, pretty far out for us, wearing a camel hair jacket and a leather belt about his waist and eating locusts and wild honey. Certainly, if John the Baptist showed up uh, down by coffee culture, we would probably go to Tim Hortons that day. Or if he showed up at Tim Hortons, I'm pretty sure we'd go to coffee culture because it would be intimidating, no doubt. But in John's day, it was attractive because it meant something. John's appearance and John's message was consistent with the Jewish prophetic and apocalyptic tradition. So John, as wild as he seems to us, was an expression of part of a style of Jewish spirituality, uh, the way they proclaimed their message, and part of their expectation of how someone who's called of God for the particular message would appear. So, John the Baptist was different in an expected way. Now, he proclaimed the coming of Jesus, and he proclaimed someone who would be greater than he. John the Baptist prepared the way for someone who would be different both in a recognizable way and different in a brand new way. Jesus would have seemed quite similar to John the Baptist, actually. He may not have worn the uh, camel hair jacket. He may not have had the, uh, the leather belt about his waist, and he may or may not have spent some time eating locusts and wild honey. He was known to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was known to him. Doubtless, they were friends, of course, well, they were related, and they would have hung out together, and they would have learned together. So Jesus, because he was similar in form to even John the Baptist, he was recognizable to the Jews. Jesus reflected a tradition that was familiar or expected in his time. But Jesus did more than that. Jesus brought something that was unexpected and something that was recognizable to many more people than just the Jews of his time. It's important, I always, when I think of this particular passage that starts when you read it in the um, New Revised Standard Version, which is the version we have in our pews, the Gospel of Mark starts with the beginning of the good news. And it's quite significant and startling, actually, that the Gospel of Mark starts by saying the beginning of the good news because it is commonly known or accepted to have been written and first read at about 70 A.D. Now, the startling thing about 70 A.D. in a book that starts with the beginning of the good news is that in 70 A.D., Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was in rubble. So this book is written to Jews outside of Jerusalem who have just recently heard that their holy city has been destroyed and their spiritual home, their temple, 
is now rubble. The priests that Jesus spoke of, the Sadducees and Pharisees and many of the faithful Jews of his, of his time who were contemporaries of Jesus in that same gospel would have been gone. Yet the book begins with this is the beginning of the good news. It's significant, therefore, that Jesus wasn't just recognizable to the Jews. Jesus, when you read the Gospels, was recognizable to the Romans. The story of Jesus includes his respect for and kindness to Roman centurions and Roman leadership. The story of Jesus includes kindness toward and respect for the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were a group of people who lived north of Judea who came from the line of Abraham, just like the Jews did, who would have represented the lost tribes of Israel. So they would have descended from Abraham, but they weren't from the tribe of Judah. And so they were disliked for another reason, for a number of reasons, by the Jews. But they represented children of Abraham who were scattered or dispersed outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea. And with the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews to whom this Gospel of Mark was written were also outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, and also could no longer be connected to that temple like they were before because it had been destroyed. It's significant that Jesus was recognizable too, that he was kind toward and respected tax gatherers because the tax gatherers referred to in the Gospels were Jews who worked for the empire. With the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews that were outside of Jerusalem who survived, who were part of the diaspora, they had long adopted Greek and Roman, well, some Greek and Roman forms and traditions, their language. This book is written in Greek, not in Aramaic. And it's significant that this gospel, which is the beginning of good news, is includes and is respectful toward women. Because that first church, that first band of believers who, who survived, who carried on a Hebrew tradition in a Greek and Roman world, were carried largely through the work of, through the work of women. Because the first church was a home church. So, This gospel, this beginning of the good news, this introduction of John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus is an illustration of how those things which are old and familiar to us often prepare the way and become part of that which is new and broader and deeper and richer. So, how do we change? How do we live as a congregation faithful to our traditions? How do we remain how do we remain recognizable as Trinity United Church 
while being relevant to the needs of our day and the hope of our future. How do we live and minister careful to understand what it means to connect and remain connected? Well, of course, today we have Facebook, we have a website, we send email quite easily. Also, with respect to connection in our new day, we include indigenous reconciliation, which we didn't, we didn't think of doing that in the past. But that's part of our ministry of connection and reconnection today. Rainbow Sabbath and Affirm. These are things we didn't have to think about in the past but we must think about today. This is how we discover and respect and appreciate all the Samaritans of our day who, are, who have been marginalized or forgotten and unnecessarily so, unhelpfully so. How do we change or live out our understanding of inspire? Well, I believe that part of it would be to continue our work in gender equity, including greater participation in worship. That's uh, very intentional in including Norma and valuing, acknowledging, and honoring gifts, calling, and formation not just for those who are ordained, but for those who respond to their call and work hard to be prepared for that call in a different way. And not just in delivery of worship, but in preparation uh, for worship. Our United Church has a place for licensed lay worship leaders who are full members with a call to worship leadership, who develop their gifts through study and are licensed by a presbytery. And of course, that's normal with us this morning. The United Church has room for sacramental elders, full members of a pastoral, tra pastoral charge who are licensed by the conference to administer the sacraments within their pastoral charge. And these are very important because as the church continues to survive and to be relevant in, as, the, as the years progress, and the way we prepare ordained ministers now and have for decades becomes less and less normative, equipping the laity is an important part of our survival in the future. How do we change our understanding of serve? Well, Trinity's done this very nicely with our work with environmental stewardship and real. Lay leadership also includes um, youth work, parish nursing, the work of our Christian community team, and a new ministry of the United Church that, that we're exploring both as a Christian community team and individuals in our church, um, a ministry called Healing Pathway, which is presented as a new thing, but it borrows or it's a revival of our ancient tradition of calling together our elders when someone is sick, calling together our elders for prayer and reviving or it echoes an ancient form of anointing. Much of what we do and will do as a church that seems new is not new at all. It's what we've always done. And now we're just speaking in a new age. And not just speaking to a new age. We are preparing a place 
where we can be at home and where our children, where people this high can call home 20 or 30 years from now. A place where, where I can leave and you can leave in a new form and our children will lead in a new form even still. This is the beginning of the good news. As we change, as we see the, the reality of our world about us, and we're able to draw upon those old traditions and revive or adapt or reserve them in new ways, we will be able to echo and proclaim that this is the beginning of the good news just as the writer of Mark did. So our children this morning, they are, we don't say that children are the, are the uh, church of today, uh, sorry, the church of the future, the children are the future of t today. See, this is why I write things down. Yes. Our children are the church of today, and they are our future leadership. Now, part of what we remember is to prepare a place that reflects the work of our age and will be relevant to the children who led us this morning. And again, this is the beginning of the good news. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we pray that you would cause this church to be a faithful place a place in which our traditions, the love of Scripture, the concern for our community continues and is recognizable and lives and breathes, and a place where we learn how to bring these traditions in a respectful and relevant way to others just as Jesus was relevant to Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, women, tax gatherers and lepers, cause us to be relevant not just to those who are already included within our tradition, but those who have been inappropriately marginalized, left out, or placed aside. Cause us to be a people who are faithful in carrying and preparing our traditions to live in the future in a new way, through your spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name.